brought to you by the Green Party of Alameda County. Uh, today we'll be having a joint discussion between myself, Aidan Hill, and Cheryl Dabla. Uh, we're both activists in the city of Berkeley, as well as running for the upcoming city of Berkeley elections. Uh, before we begin on the introductions, I'd like to recognize that we are on the unceded Ohlone land and that we all benefit from the forced assimilation, separation, and marginalization of American Indians since Sp Spanish missionaries settled in San Francisco. It's important that we recognize this and understand the differences of how we came to be. We belong to a multidisciplinary environmental space that has provided shelter for many of us throughout the years. And so we recognize the uh, Sigorite Land Trust brought by indigenous Ohlone uh, women that are urban led. And we hope that everyone can support their efforts to reclaim land for Ohlone sovereignty. Um, so Cheryl, uh, would you like to give a brief introduction about like why you're here and uh, what what makes you want to run for public office once again? Hi, so yeah, I'm Council Member Cheryl Davila, the District 2 representative. And I feel like the last three and a half years have been amazing, but there's a lot more work to do. And, um, you know, welcome to the city of Berkeley, Ohlone Territory. It was one of the accomplishments I made, uh, changing the welcome signs to say that instead of the Berkeley city limits with a, a false um, number for the population. Um, but, you know, Berkeley is uh, an amazing city. We've had, um, I've lived here for 39 years, brought my children up here in Berkeley, um, both went to Berkeley Unified School District. And um, over the time I've been in Berkeley, <clears throat> You know, I wasn't always involved, but now that I'm here and doing this job, I feel there's so much work to do. We have to have a more transparent budget process, um, a more transparent budget, maybe change from a cash basis to uh, accrual basis accounting. And, um, you know, get District 2, which is a beautiful district, a world you know, it encompasses the world because there was so many different um, ethnicities and businesses and types of businesses, commercial, non-commercial, private. Um, and it's, you know, we need more beautification without displacement and gentrification. And I want to get that done for real in District 2 in my second term. You know, get more of the streets paved that need to be paved. You know, I made a lot of accomplishments, got the pool open all year round, increased the shower program, but there's so much more to do. And it takes so long to figure out like what's going on in the city. Um, so you really need a second term to get accomplished um, your tasks or your visions. So that's why I'm here. I love the city. I've been here for 39 years don't have any plan to move anywhere else. I'm a renter, um, so I understand all those idiosyncrasies that people have to go through as a tenant. Um, and as a black woman in America who has always been um, pushing for the truth and, and justice and have seen how my, I myself have been held back because of the color of my skin. So I want to change that for the future of um, our Berkeley residents um, and make sure that we yeah. all have the opportunities that we seek. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Um, I want to echo many of the statements that you've said. I'm also a Black person of color. Um, I'm personally a student, but a little bit of my background is that I'm 27 years old. I originally was born in Southern California and I moved to Berkeley to pursue a bachelor's degree at UC Berkeley. Um, that was great, but we happened to be in the 2016 election cycle when I was able to come in. Despite that, uh, I first volunteered with the California Public Interest Research Group to help pass the plastic bag ban in California um, that limited much of the plastic single waste uh, that we had in the area, as well as the city and state as a whole. 
Um, after that, I was actually uh, running for office in 2018, specifically to support the unhoused people as well as the students at People's Park. And I found very quickly that uh, the city establishment wanted to build those on this park, even though it was used as a sanctuary, a food opportunity uh, center, um, as well as people growing their own food there. And it made very uh, little sense to me at the time why they were doing this. But afterwards, I, when I saw what happened in the city, how homeless people were being treated, um, it made perfect sense that this was more gentrification. And luckily, I was appointed to the Homeless Commission by you, Cheryl. And um, now I'm the vice chair of the Homeless Commission, and I've been able to author uh, various resolutions, one being the People's First Sanctuary Encampment Model to make sure people uh, who are unhoused have access to water and trash removal services. And uh, I currently actively fight for People's Park, uh, 2.8 acres of green space, which we intend to use as a temporary refuge area if there's an earthquake. And we've been developing, developing emergency preparedness plans with neighbors, stores, and residents alike. Mm. Um, so I want to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. The first one dealing with the pandemic that we have right now, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we recently seen an uptick in cases uh, around the entire country and even in Alameda County. So I want to get your perspective of the national to local situation that's happening with the COVID-19 crisis. So COVID has brought to light the the um, disparities that I've experienced all my life. Um, but now everybody knows the systemic, um, in structural, institutional, environmental racism that um, people of color, especially black people, and Latinx people have, to, have had to endure um, by pushing them out into the communities where these toxic, toxic environments um, are to live. And um, so it, 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 and it's, it's put on the national headline and that, and well, we're all in the same playing field for one. The whole world is dealing with one issue, the pandemic, right? And it's impacted the whole world in the same way. All around the world, the people of color are the ones that are dying, right? All the people that are marginalized, because, and how is that? Because they lived in an environment that compromised their immune systems, you know, and they've had to live with these, like uh, asthma or whatever that illness is that ca that's being caused by the, the pollution that they've had to live in. So that's the one thing that the pandemic has done is brought to light. Another thing it's done, it's forced us to be inside, to deal with our families, our issues, you know, try to resolve. It's also forced us to go back to what we used to do. It's like cooking, right? <laughs> Hanging out with family, you know, just your immediate family, you know? Um, and it's brought blue skies back, right? We never thought that we'd have free transportation. We just cruise through the bridges and have them send us our ticket as long as we pay it on time. But, you know, we have to make sure, though, that all those people that have lost their jobs get new jobs, right? Because now we have contact tracing, you know, and all these other kinds of instances where people can rethink um, how they're doing things. So COVID's been bad, it's been horrible, but it's also an opportunity to change and not go back to business as usual. You know, we can't go back to the capitalism and the corruption that's gotten us here today. So um, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, it does. Um, I definitely want to respond to that uh, because you mentioned the underlying conditions a lot of people face. And it reminds me uh, about a century ago what happened in Oakland when uh, poor people of color were forced to work in the coal mines. Mm. And that created many things like asthma, like you mentioned, but also the way we have moved as a society 
it creates conditions like diabetes, lung damage. And uh, if you're specifically an unhoused person living in Berkeley and you're off a freeway or a street, that's even more of a condition to uh, prevent you from being able to breathe. Um, as we're going into the summer months, it's not lost on me that many people are suffering from uh, heat stroke, dehydration, and if people can't breathe during these times, they're not going to be able to recover from COVID-like symptoms. Um, but you also mentioned something I want to touch on, which is the being a part of your families. And so I definitely agree that like now we have a lot of time to get to know our families and be around each other. There's also greater um, response and a greater uptick in domestic violence cases. Yes. Uh, yeah, we see a lot of um, women and uh, trans people being suffering from the fact that they either have to stay with an abusive partner or they have to try to find housing in a housing insecure market. And so I wanted you to touch on that. Have you um, faced any of those issues in your district? Um, and what is your response to uh, the situations where domestic violence might occur in families? That is such a, uh, a thing that's, you're so right. It's like the numbers for domestic violence are increasing. Um, and, you know, right now there's, there's not really an option for people to get out of those situations. And one of the things that I tried and was not successful, but am still trying to do, back when this whole thing first started was I was like, we need to have domestic violence and mental health numbers on the COVID website at the top, not buried in a click, no, just the information right there so that everybody can see it. That hasn't happened yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that needs to happen. And now it's like, you know, with all the things that are going on, I don't really know how to get out of those situations. That's a complex situation, but you have to, if you need to leave, you know, go, I don't know where, but you have to, if you have a friend, you can go to the, you know, there's different resources out there that people have that they can, call or go to. So yes, that's something that I really would like to see on the website so that you don't have to bury and look for that number. Um, and on all the COVID related information because it's, 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 it's a problem. And that's even in Berkeley, that's what they said a lot of the phone calls for 911 are, there's been an uptick. So for sure. And then with mental health, you know, I feel we need to do a much, much, much better job, especially for our unhoused community. Um, because I saw from our friend 300 how just in the short period of time when he returned back to the street, how his, he deteriorated. Um, and, and so you, you deter your mental health deteriorates back well, I don't know from experience, but from what I can see, it goes down really quickly when you become unhoused. And we're not really addressing that on the daily because we have to reach out, come back, continue the relationship. And it might take time, but sometimes it might be short. And we're not, I don't see that continuous outreach to really benefit our community. And that's yeah. something I would like to see changed in my next term as well. Yeah, as I run for the 2020 mayor's race, I, that's definitely not lost on me. It really does seem like there's a lack of options for people to find housing that's not only cost efficient, but is available and publicly accessible without having to do bureaucracy or put their names on a list. Um, we have a comment uh, from the audience uh, what happens with the empty hotels? Are people who are in um, domestic violence situations able to use them? Because I've heard a lot of uh, the lack of hotel spaces in Berkeley. I've heard that uh, on University Avenue that there's two hotels now being used to house unhoused people. But do you know anything more about like if people facing different marginalizations are able to access spaces? Or how do people who are facing a marginalized situation um, able to find shelter in these times? That's a good question. It's unfortunate that La Quinta's, that um, 
was going to open up um, never happened. And it's taken this long to get two more hotels online. And they're only going to be 68. Well, six only, but the 68 is better than none, I guess. <clears throat> but I would like to see more because we have, we know we have over a thousand people on our streets and I'm sure that number has increased and we don't know what that number is currently, but 68 rooms will be coming available. I'm not exactly sure when, but mm -hmm. soon. Um, the county is working in partnership with the city of Berkeley and the city of Berkeley will be taking on the mental health services for that. I, so I think I recall from the COVID call on Friday um, that we have once a week to update us on what's going on by the city manager and her team. Um, so that's what they said last Friday. Um, and they also have those 18 trailers, which um, the city received, requested eight and Oakland gave us 10. I don't know why the city didn't request more, but we have 18. Um, yeah. And there's occupied currently. Uh, but the thing, the thing is too, is that we also have to decommission some of the shelters down to lower numbers so that people can physically distance. So those are the, some of the people that were in shelter went into the trailers. So they're not really taking people off the street so much. Um, which really needs to happen more so than has already. I mean, we are like how long, like three, four months into the COVID pandemic and it's been a limited amount of numbers of people that they've actually gotten off the street and into a hotel room or shelter. So I think we can do better and come up with more creative ways to, to help people. And then, you know, it's like I was driving by the Shell Mound or the, not the Shell Mound, the um, freeway entrance, what do they call that? The eyebrows um, on university the other day. And it looks like they haven't picked up the trash. It looks like the, all this stuff that's right by the edge might be the trash that they've never picked up. We have to do better. We're in a pandemic. Why? People argue over whose property it is, but who the hell cares whose property it is? They're human beings. They need dignity. Help them with just even that. You know, get the rats out of there because of the trash. You know, it's like, so it's really a struggle sometimes, but we got to keep on fighting the good fight because. Um, I I can tell you a little bit of uh, what I've seen on the ground. Now, I don't have necessarily the platform to say things about what's happening in the city of Berkeley other than the city council meetings, public comments. Um, however, I've seen a lot of struggling folks uh, try to just access basic food security, and especially those who are unhoused. Um, in my work at People's Park, uh, beginning at the beginning of this crisis, the University of California was really trying to push people outside of that space. But since there hasn't been as much assistance other than one social worker uh, to get spaces, a lot of people are using their tents in green open spaces. Um, one, because it's a safer environment than being on sidewalks and the streets, depending on violence or ac uh, lack of access to resources. But another thing is that people naturally are able to collaborate and come together and form these encampments to protect themselves. Um, I've always stated that if the, it's the responsibility of government to house people because housing is a human right. And when the government can't do that or refuses to do that, it's the responsibility of people to find safe conditions for themselves. And uh, something that I've really found troubling is when I walk around the city of Berkeley, for example, like at Aquatic Park, um, the hand uh, washing stations aren't maintained. They're lacking water, they're lacking soap, they're lacking access to clean restroom facilities, and even the porta potties. I'm hearing that um, the porta potties are, they're, um, how do I put it? They're, they're not being maintained. For maintenance. They're not being maintained. and they're being actually taken away from some groups of people, much to the same degree that they hear their encampments, porta potties were taken away and Friends of Adeline actually had to pay for them. Um, but 
all throughout all of this, what I've noticed is the city and the UC are kind of collaborating together to take away green spaces from people. Um, you can mention People's Park, but there's also the Guild Track Farms, there's the Oxford Tract. And what we really do need for these spaces is making sure that there's food security as well as temporary refuge. Um, could you just talk a little bit about that? Like how does uh, temporary refuge and green spaces affect people positively in the COVID crisis? And then we'll talk about environmental justice as a whole. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've seen people in Civic Center Park, you know, now they have tents up there. But um, I think, you know, I mean, I'm totally into maintaining our green spaces. You know, we don't have that many of them, especially in certain areas. My, my district has three parks, Aquatic, Strawberry Creek, and San Pablo Park. But, you know, Civic Center Park, Telegraph, People's Park should be green space forever, you know? Um, and I feel that now that people are, you know, we're in a crisis and, and supposedly we're maintaining um, contact with outreach sometimes more than ever since I've been in office. So what do we give people to eat? A can of tuna, a can of peas, water, some hand sanitizer, and like a power bar. Why not give them like a healthy sandwich or like a delicious meal with greens, you know, a protein and, you know, from some fruit? Because the, the food that's given isn't really sustainable to keep them healthy and happy and their mind able to, to cope under all the circumstances that they're already in now dealing with COVID on top of that, you know, um, and all the other things that they might be dealing with, we don't know about, right? Um, exactly. So I think, but one thing I heard today when I was on my um, church, I, I listen on Sundays, sometimes I'll be listening to Mickey Avenue Baptist Church and the way simultaneously my daughter was going, how can you do that? But you know, I'll, I'll watch and listen to both. Um, but this morning I found out that The Way is going to be giving out bags of food on Wednesdays, um, I believe down at um, Seabreeze. So okay. yeah, so that's gonna be every Wednesday and they're looking, I think I'll have to figure out the location, but I'm pretty sure that's what they said. So that's great. and I, you know, um, also like the McGee Avenue Baptist Church is feeding people, I think, more days a week now as well. So, and there you get real food. You know, we need to have real food that's really going to make people have, be, you know, that are nutritious and make them feel better, at least their bellies and their mind for that moment that they get to eat that food, right? And the food has to be accessible because I know some elders who don't have extra teeth to chew food. And so we have to think about different ways of preparation. Some people mm -hmm. are food and free. Some people can't have excess salts or sugars. And so the way that we have to form these food coalitions, we can't just simply rely on small businesses and uh, local food banks or community groups to supply this. Uh, in my opinion, we have to really focus on the nutritional content that we give people in the city of Berkeley. Uh, because if, without the nutrition, even if it's just empty calories, it's not going to work for the vast majority of us. Um, yes, we, we need a, nutritious meals, really, we yes. do. We have a question from the audience. Uh, we're in an extreme emergency, and would either of us advocate for extreme measures to take over abandoned public buildings? Do you want to answer? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I can answer that legitimately, <laughs> but, but my idea for, uh, in that regard is his lordships, right? His lordships mm -hmm. is, was a restaurant. If, if we could do something like, what do they call that place in, um, San Francisco? Now it's the name is escaping me, but it's the restaurant where formerly incarcerated folks are the um, work there. I can't think of the mm -hmm. name of it. 
It'll I don't come remember to me. either. Maybe. Delancey. But... Delancey Place. Delancey, yes. Um, something like that, you know, that could like feed people, give them jobs, you know, that's big enough to do something, but the city now is like in negotiations. But that was my, I was hoping for a miracle that somehow that could happen and maybe it could in a different location somewhere. Because I think that kind of a model, you know, they could be feeding the unhoused, you know, they could be training people for jobs, giving people jobs, you know. Um, like maybe the Berkeley Food Network could move in there. It's a big enough place. They could have a restaurant, you know. Who knows? You know, that's that's something that I I I was hoping and dreaming for, you know. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. And uh, to answer the question in a fair way, I definitely support public housing of every kind. And so what I would hope in the future, um, especially if elected, is that we would form some type of public housing program where we can reclaim empty spaces, abandoned buildings, uh, vacant lots, and really try to develop low cost solutions for everyone. And I definitely support uh, repairing work um, because it's a real form of work and people should be paid for any uh, repairing jobs that they do. But also we have to teach people how to use solar energy and different types of alternative energies in, in exchange for uh, coal, gas, and oil products. Um, That's so, so true. And so I, I wanted to mention briefly, like, why are we here? Why are we having this conversation? And it really is about political courage. And what do I mean by political courage? It takes a lot of guts, not only to run for office, but to stand up against any opposition. Uh, we can only look at the national government and how anyone who speaks out, they're met with hasty responses, Twitter tags, and uh, really a form of gaslighting uh, for contrary decisions or contrary perspectives. Uh, but both Cheryl Davila and myself have shown a, a degree of political courage, uh, not only trying to stop the police union from having uh, the excess amount in their budgets, but also how we go out there day to day and talk to regular citizens and try to fight for their human rights. Um, so Cheryl, I wanted to ask you, what are your perspectives of racial justice? What does it mean to have racial justice in this time of increased police militarization, ICE raids, and how can we really help people find sanctuary in our sanctuary city? You know, I have an item tomorrow on the health enrichment and blah, blah, blah policy committee that says um, declare racism as a public health crisis, a threat and safety issue. I think that's the first step. I think because we have, we, here we are in a COVID pandemic, we have the climate catastrophe waiting to happen as well as the next big quake waiting to happen. And you know, we're all not ready for any of that. But I feel like, especially now, I mean, I worked on that item for over a year. And, you know, I was like, okay, after George Floyd, I was like, yes, we're gonna just submit it, you know? And so we did, and now it's there. But I feel like people aren't really ready to help each other until we deal with all the isms that are keeping us apart. That's the first step, because in a catastrophe, you know, I mean, right now, COVID's brought out all the racism. You know, we've had an incident in Indi at the, I hate to call it Indian Rock, but Indian Rock. Um, and, Some people um, call it Ohlone Rock. Ohlone Rock, that's much better. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there was one near the Claremont area. And, you know, I mean, I've been dealing with racism all my life and I, as a council member and from on the dais during the meetings. So although some people might not call it that, but that's exactly what it is. Um, people don't recognize the implicit bias and all the different things that are the little microaggressions, you know, so we have to talk about that. Um, we have to really figure that out because I think that's the very first step to move forward to, to and then, you know, we all have to be emergency prepared and do all these other things as well. Now I lost track of the question. 
So <laughs> just what's racial justice to you and how it racial can be achieved? Racial justice, yeah. So, you know, wow, I don't even know because there's never been racial justice in my lifetime. So, you know, I don't even know what that would look like, you know, but I think the start is to dealing with the conversations, the hard conversations, because they, that's just the first step. Um, and justice, you know, wow, it would be nice. Here I am 64 years old, you know, I mean, my hopes for owning a home is gone, you know, because it's kind of too late now. Um, and I feel the color of my skin is the reason why I'm not a homeowner today. You know, it's the reason why I've had to, you know, you know, I've had different jobs and, you know, had to figure things out on my own and, you know, I tempt because I couldn't afford to go to school. So I learned on the job, you know, I mean, there's all these different things that people of color have to go through to do things differently just to get as far as we've gotten, you know? Um, yeah. So, but justice, um, yeah. For me, uh, I mean, my story coming to Berkeley is a form of that fight for racial justice. I originally started in Fontana, California. It's a low income neighborhood. It's about the same size as Berkeley actually, but many blocks on the streets didn't even have sidewalks. Uh, so many kids went without food and everyone seemed, at least in my year when we were graduating from high school, everyone was excited to work for Amazon and different warehouse jobs because that was the best way that they can have a career. Um, coming to Berkeley, I was lucky enough to be accepted into UC Berkeley, but my housing, my food security, and even being able to access the resources at that school was underpinned. We allowed space for Milo Yiannopoulos, who isn't even like, let's say born in this country. And we destroyed spaces for the, uh, especially the Palestinian students who are trying to advocate for themselves and all people of color. Uh, so much to the point where at UC Berkeley, they literally have a row of police cars right outside of the Black Student Union, which just so happens to be put in a trailer at the back of the university. And so these are things that are happening. Uh, for my ideas of racial justice, it, it definitely has to start with the kids and it has to start with taking police out of schools and making sure that those schools are in a safe environment. Um, and it, it, it also has to go with education and making sure that everyone has an opportunity to re-educate themselves or get an education that is fulfilling and low cost. And, I definitely sympathize with you with the housing. Um, I wouldn't be able to have this apartment if it wasn't for my grandfather's uh, wealth and they were in the military. Um, when I was out here in Berkeley, I couldn't find housing myself because you have to pay multiple rents. You have to get um, landlords like letters of recommendation and that's unfeasible for the vast majority of people. And so a path to home ownership and being able to hold um, your personal property in a space that you feel comfortable with I think that's that those rights should be to everyone. Access to mental health and healthcare in general should be for everyone. Um, and so I wanted to mention that if you have a response. Yeah, we, we need to have equal rights and equal justice, you know, like ha be able to have the same um, circumstances or the same opportunities, right, as our white counterparts. We don't, you know. And justice, yes, justice will looks like defunding the police 50% and putting those uh, money towards other things that will really help our community. Because if we had put, you know, it's like when I got into office and there was the shootings at San Pablo Park, what did everybody say? Back when we had the parks where it was booming and everybody was using the parks and they had all these programs for youth and mentorships, there wasn't the same kind of dynamic happening, right? And yeah. we need that. And they eliminated all those things. We need to go back. We need to go back to, to putting time and effort into our youth and, and, and making them have, letting them have opportunities, letting them know that they're loved and they're cared for. And, and even, I mean, we love, you know, the people that are supposed to protect us too. 
but let's take the police out of the equation and maybe call them peace officers because that's what they used to be called when they were really more community orientated, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, Berkeley back in the day, they didn't even carry weapons, I was told, you know? A long, long, long time ago, you know? Back in the so, past, before the <laughs> militarization. Yes. So, you know, um, gee, can you imagine what that might look like if we got rid of all weapons, you know? Put us all on the same playing field, you know? It's um, an achievable goal. And get some housing, you know? Right now, luckily, there's going to be uh, all, like, I think it's 63 units in Berkeley on San Pablo and Blake in District 2. That's going to be all affordable housing, as well as the Model Shurik uh, building uh, at um, Ashby and um, Adeline. So that's two buildings, but we that's two out of all the ones that have been built, right? So we need to build more truly affordable the BART station should be 100%, 100% affordable housing because that's what we need to get people really into homes and off the street. Yeah, and I definitely want to echo that because we don't need we don't need private investors to make housing for us. We don't need market rate housing. We can actually use people who want to learn skills and jobs and work trades to develop public housing, develop housing that's for below income people. And uh, of course that would specifically help for people of color and people of color in general, because not only can they be a part of the building process of Berkeley, they should have access to uh, being a part of those buildings as a whole for being workers in the city of Berkeley. Um, I really want to touch on prison reform um, because abolition and the state of the world right now, which is in white supremacy, is a goal for all of us to reach to. Just much like the during the Civil War where abolitionists came and put their bodies on the line, we too have to put our bodies on the line, not just for the Black children that are being killed, but for those who are being in, in detention centers and those who are being forced to deal with weapons being used on their own communities. So can you talk a little bit about Berkeley's relationship to um, the, pres the prison Santa Rita and how can we make tangible changes to how people are taken and treated while in the prison system? You know, in April, I put in an item to defund the sheriffs, or uh, to not support the sheriffs Ahern's $85 million ask for Santa Rita jail, right? Uh, that was like uh, watered down. Um, and then it, just in June, one of the other council members put in the same kind of item, but it was 84 versus 85 million. And that passed unanimously, you know? So it was like, uh, but that's, you know, we don't need, look what's happening in the jails right now. They have COVID rampant, you know, it's like Santa Rita, San Quentin, you know, our brothers and sisters are going to be dying because they don't, because they're in that environment where they can't isolate themselves or really get the medical treatment that they need. You know, I mean, why haven't they let out Leonard Pelletier and, and, and Momia, you know? It's like, we must no, do so much, much better in that, in that regard. Um, prisons, we need to eliminate the death penalty, period. Um, and, and, and only incarcerate folks that I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not a, a illegalese, I mean, but you know, but people that are really like murderers and you know things like that, and and you know crimes where like I mean, there's so many people that are in jail now because of marijuana or you know low drug offenses that could be let out, you know, during this time yeah. of COVID, and they should be. So exactly. we know we were we were mostly impacted during those times of the drug war. 
So we have to really look at that and, and those injustices as well and try to redo them and then expunge those records as well. Exactly. I definitely think that prison should be a sentence of last resort um, because not only do prisons increase recidivism, meaning multiple people go back into the prison system, mm -hmm. but also it's separation from their community. And we have to remember not all prisoners look the same. Some people have children and they're single parents. Some people have uh, elder adults that they have to take care of. And if we just incarcerate people for breaking the law, and some of these laws are simply loitering, right? Um, if we just incarcerate them, that's not going to solve anything. Instead, they have to be housed, they have to be educated, they should have mental health training and mental health advisors for their entire parole. And I really do believe that like, they should, even prisoners that are in jail should still have equal right to the ballot to make political decisions for um, whoever would represent them. Because we see with incarcerated folks, their opinions aren't necessarily taken into consideration. Um, and so th did you want to expand on that a little bit? Like they don't even have a right to vote. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a felony, your, 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 your ability to vote is taken away. And the other problem with prisons is like the food and treating like animals and like inhuman, like, like people aren't human, you know, we're all human beings. We need to treat everyone with dignity, no matter what, if they did a crime, they're still a human being and still need to have nutrition and be able to eat. I mean, I've talked to some, several people that have been incarcerated and that's the thing that they say. And then, and then, you know, they, they do stupid things like they don't, they don't give them like clothing or, or, you know, toothbrushes and soap and like all the things that you need to just function and be human. That's taken away when you go to jail. So all many the people things. don't know. Um, many people don't know that there's been multiple cases of black women being released from jail at night and then that being too. found murdered. So yeah. it's definitely a racial issue. Yeah, I mean, that woman, that was a couple of years ago, she was let out at three in the morning and never made it, never made it home, you know, and that's, that's, but this is the things, I mean, okay, policing started from slave patrols. That whole same ideology is taken a different form, but it's never really gone away, right? So that's Absolutely. why we have to deal with the racism in, in every aspect of and form first, I think. Yes, I agree. And then someone wrote in the comments, like, how can we have a real police commission that can fire cops uh, with abuses? And how can they uh, affect abusers too? And so I have an idea, but I wanted to give you a chance to uh, Tell well, you, you know, that. The, the, that, that ballot measure, there is a ballot measure which got seriously watered down. Um, I think I abstained on that vote just because it wasn't quite what it should be. I mean, I abstained for a reason. Um, I try to make things better, but if it's just still bad, I, I just can't vote for it, so I'll abstain. Um, so I think that was one of the things, but it's I guess better than nothing, but now is the moment. Maybe we could change that ballot measure. You know, it's going to be, I think, July 21st on the uh, agenda, all the ballot measures. So, you know, people support, support, start sending those letters. Let's change it so that we get some more teeth in it. Some teeth, because it's a little watered down right now. Yeah. And, and I definitely agree that for just for decriminalization and trying to make police a little bit more responsible, a lot more responsible. We need to make sure that they're not being paid to go through lawsuits by the city. They should be able to use that overtime pay, that back pay, and use it towards their own lawsuits. Um, a way to make the police commission, I think, a little bit more stronger is really having a public record of police officers that are known to be abusive or known to be silent or allow abuse to happen while they're on patrol. 
Um, a lot of times we see videos of one cop hurting another person. We're like, what do other cops have to do with any of it? But they're sitting by mm -hmm. and abusing. And, yeah, and we can't forget just in Oakland, like the effects of people who are doing sex work and how cops are trying to force those people into sex acts, like that should be not noted in public record, especially through the police commission. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, also they're like, you know, if, if they're like part of the Oak Keepers or the Proud Boys or like, you know, the KKK, you know, or or whatever other stuff they're doing outside, like um, that's going to influence their their day job, you know, should be out and transparent as well. And they those and and they should not be allowed to continue in those positions. I feel because um, I mean that's 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 the problem right i mean we already know in berkeley we have the cpe report that sh shows us the disparities that goes on here and it's gotten worse during covid which is really kind of pathetic but it's the truth and it was it wasn't until covid another good thing covid did was got the chief of police to start putting that record on online so that people can see but the the outcome is still the same except it's gotten worse so you know yeah we i mean defunding the police has to do with moving those monies into the areas where they can be better utilized and really help the community you know because mm -hmm. um the system that we have is broken and you can't like reprogram you know like 10 years of urban shield you know that's that's you can't do that i don't think so exactly um, and to think about those tactics being used on young people i mean berkeley police right now already tackles people on asphalt even and so having expressive military tactics i mean you mentioned that there were tanks out there and why a city, especially a sanctuary city, would use those on their citizens, it, it seems like it's something straight out of George Orwell's, uh, and a militarized and a surveillance state. And they weren't Berkeley's, because Berkeley's is a white um, band. And hmm. so they were mutual aid. You know, why are we requesting mutual aid like that? We have our own. That could have just been sitting there since it wasn't needed anyway. And it would have looked, mm -hmm. looked less intrusive right but no we had the ones that are like gonna scare people into shape and you know whatever um, cheryl do you think we could talk a little bit about uh the rise of corporations i mean we have elon musk in uh berkeley at the tesla center uh we have facebook and uh amazon coming in from san francisco and silicon valley like, what is the effect of corporations uh, taking land and spaces away from community businesses? And how does climate change play into this as resources become more scarce uh, and people start looking for cheaper options? And even with COVID, uh, how people can't go to businesses as much as before, how do we affect the changes we need to protect our sanctuary city and protect our or local economy, not necessarily contribute to a multinational economy. Yeah, I just heard that Amazon is moving into Fourth Street, right? They took mm -hmm. over several, so they're going to be humongous. That's really a problem for me. Um, for one, they're not good to their workers. They don't pay their workers. They haven't been good during COVID. Um, a lot of them have come down with COVID. Um, but you know, capitalism is not the answer. We know what capitalism has done. It's put us to where we are today, right? Um, yeah. And like I said, we can't go back to business as usual. So to me, it's kind of sad that they would be coming to Berkeley. Like at one point in time, that may have not have happened, you know, but now we have like three targets within a mile of a or two of each other 
Um, so yeah, I think that's something got to give on that too. When did all of this change? Because I know Berkeley was really a local town that protected its local businesses. I know. I mean, even like the um, the seventy six gas station, I think it is, has a Burger King in it now. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, how yeah. did that happen? You know, it's like, luckily it's on the other side of the street, not in District 2, but, you know, <laughs> but it's still bad. I mean, you know, I, I never eat fast food, ever, never. I mean, and I told my kids were young, that was the thing. I said, it's junk, you can't have it until someone took them and they're like, oh, you know, it's not so bad. I'm like, it's terrible, don't eat it ever again. But, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, so we, I don't know, we have to figure out a way to, to, to do better for sure. Cause we can't allow these humongous big corporations taking over our little city. <laughs> yeah. And then maybe correct me if I'm wrong, there was a, um, something from the city, like the Berkeley Relief Fund, that was supposed to give a lot of extra money to different small businesses, residents, and what they said is the arts. Do you think any of the small businesses that applied for the most part got access to those funds? Because I definitely know on Telegraph, people had applied and then weren't able to be given any access. You know, that's some businesses in District 2 um, have told me the same thing. And there's multiple rounds of it. So, and I've been asking, I don't know if I've received because I'm not always on top of all the emails I get and my, you know, we file them. So I have to look for it. But um, I did ask for the demographics of those grants, but I'm not sure I received them. Um, yeah. But that would be an interesting thing. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I can't even say, but just if you look at the videos, it doesn't look like it's been um, widespread mm -hmm. from the videos, just saying. Um, what I heard is the majority of the funding went to the arts, which is a curious thing to say. Uh, that's, that's just what I've heard. I'd have to double check. Yeah, but I haven't looked at the list to see who got what um, lately. That was a while ago I saw it, but yeah, so I don't really know the answer to that right now off the top. But, but um, if, let's say if the arts did get funding, I'm curious, like, why libraries wouldn't be considered that? Because I've noticed a lot of bookstores closing down and uh, having access to reading materials for free, they're not getting the same funding as uh, other programs are. And I'm just curious what you think. What is the role of libraries, bookstores, and really tangible information, uh, especially in our corporate age? You know, they're an important part of uh, life. I'm not a big reader myself but actually I love reading the packet, but I'm not a big book reader, which I'm gonna to try to remedy. Um, I promised myself I would do that this year, so I'm gonna try. But, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people do. And so I think that they should have equal access for sure. And the thing is, it's like, it, I, I really need to like, see like how that money was distributed um, because, and I have said this in the council meeting, it should be equitable. It should be like, you know, not just one district or the downtown or the telegraph. It should be all throughout the city, you know, like, and I don't know what the criteria was, but there should be, when we do things like this, there should be specific criteria, you know, like an e equally distributed amongst all districts, the same amount, you know, and if there's a different round, then the same amount again, you know, so that we can say, because right now I don't know, right? And you don't know. So mm -hmm. it, to me, that's, I mean, I know I haven't really checked, but I did ask the question, but um, it should be transparent for sure, you know, and there should be criteria. I don't know that there's always, and it shouldn't, the criteria shouldn't have to change from time to time. It should just be how we do things, you know, there should be policies and protocols. And, you know, I know that's not always the case. 
and I'm not saying that happened in this case, but just throughout my time in the city, you know, I mean, I've heard from different, it depends on who you ask, you might get different answers. It should always be the same answer, right? Yeah. To the same question. So those are the well, things that I'd like to make sure happens in my second term, for sure. Something I just thought about was how last year we pretty much had a general fight about whether RV folks could stay in the city of Berkeley. But right now, due to the COVID crisis, I know the city is providing trailers for people. Does it seem a little bit ironic that we fought for so long to make sure that people could stay in the city, but now they are staying in the city through the same means which we tried to keep them in in the first place? And even the masks, right? Remember? Mm -hmm. The masks were forbidden in the park. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now everybody has to wear masks, you know, so, you know. <laughs> and same as plastic straws, for example. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we definitely see, like, at least for me, the leadership right now is kind of being circular. It, it's not really causing steps forward. And, and, I, and none of us can blame you because you're, you're the solid voice that's always in favor of people. But for many of the other council members, they're putting up initiatives like the, the stair center and then people come back with complaints and reports and ADA, uh, non-ADA compliance acknowledgements. So how do we actually use our resources effectively in like as we are both fighting to be a part of the city council and being a part of office, how do we begin to tangibly use those resources to the best of our, our ability? noting that we are in a budget shortfall and what we do prioritize is so much more essential now than ever. That's a good question. I feel like for one, we need to do like an audit of say um, pathways and find out because right now, you know, they start out with 2.4 and then all of a sudden it went down to 2.2. They made like, I'm like, huh? Okay, so now they have 2.2 and then they were going to add 705 to increase the program, but now they can't do that and they have to like um, physically distance so that 2.2 is only going to serve like 25 people, which is kind of like, what the hell, you know, like you go in there, they don't have a TV, they don't have computers, they don't, they're not like trying to lift, well, this is Cheryl speaking from my observation and from what people have told me, but I mean, there's like no yoga, no like art or, you know, things that could really try to help lift people up and change their mind and their outcomes, you know? Um, so I think they need to do a little bit better. And plus it's right next to the asphalt company. So that's mm -hmm. with the garden, you know? Yeah kind of sad but um so many things that we have to do better look at the ways to to make things more efficient and effective you know through the whole city um yeah that's just how it has to be and we have a question from the audience does Berkeley have workforce development grants for example what about training people to build tiny houses or being plumbers or electricians? Can you answer that question? That's a good question. I don't know the answer if there's like, I know, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but my thought on that topic is back in my day, they used to have the Comprehensive Education and Training Act, which actually did give you some training. It gave regular people like me, you know, back in my day, that was like in the 70s, a lot of people just, you know, and it was a higher paying wage and you had to sit in on these different things. And some people didn't really take it seriously, but I thought it was really fun. And I like taking notes and learning. So, you know, you can give people that opportunity to retrain. I mean, now that like we're, we might have to like, if we decommission these um, refineries, that's an opportunity to retrain people. Um, we have to take advantage of all those opportunities, right? And, yeah. and create new ones. So like, and you know, like with the youth works, I feel like we just cut that budget, right? And we didn't even wanna pay them 
-hmm. minimum wage, you know, which is really sad, even though we're cutting the budget, we don't still don't, whatever. But the thing is, we need to do that. And we need to like train. I think right now, the youth could be doing the um, vegetation management, you know, why, why eliminate that when they could do that, you know, for a lesser amount than you would charge your consultant or um, RFP, whatever you know, get some stuff done um, and give them, and that's giving youth a skill. We just have to retrain, get our unhoused committee people that might not are seeking employment, some opportunities, you know, they could be the workers to help the unhoused community because they already know, you know, some people are right now are able in their, in their um, mind and bodies to be able to handle that kind of position, you know, get them to help everyone, you know, give them jobs, give them dignity, you know. Um, we just have to rethink on how we're doing things to incorporate new ways. And lastly, we'll be able to talk a little bit about uh, environmentalism and environmental justice. So I wanted to um, throw this out there. It's the first time I'm announcing this, but part of my 2020 campaign platform is a moratorium on deforestation in the city of Berkeley, um, citing that we're losing our carbon buffers as well as we're not generating um, enough of a decrease in carbon emissions. And the green spaces, especially the redwood forest, have historical precedence in the city over high rise development. Um, but what are some of the things you're thinking of that will help be able to protect our natural environment? And it could be from the bay, it could be in the hills with the forest, but how can we affect uh, sustainable changes for the environment without pursuing more and more um, oil and gas and uh, timber lines being used as resources? So one item that I put in a while ago was, I can't remember the name of it, but basically it was um, planting a tree on, on, in new development. So it's like um, a certain amount of trees per development, depending on the square footage. So that's one way. Um, and I also think like, you know, with these traffic circles and how some of these trees might have to come out because they're too large, don't just take the tree out, like replant it along the freeway. You know, like don't ever dispose of, repurpose it somewhere else where it can be and live. And, and, and cause it could be a sound buffer if they're like a bunch of more trees along and it would also take some care of some of the greenhouse gases. And, um, you know, like, let's not cut down any more trees, you know, put a moratorium on tree cutting, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and as we're losing city budgets, uh, it's more important now than ever to protect our streams, rivers, and anything that can potentially give us clean water to drink, because without water, where is life? And, uh, how do you think we can provide more water into urban areas, uh, particularly places that don't have access to rivers, streams, or even the bay? Um, so one of the things that I'm taught, well, I don't know if I can really talk about it, but um, it's, a, it's a community benefit that I'm asking from somebody. I can't, I won't say who, it's but okay. it's to put, um, as part of that to put some sinks in areas like where there's this where there's like a water fountain you know put a sink there too you know so that people because because right now we have covid and we all have to be washing our hands and a lot of people don't have access to real i mean the the hand washing station is real recycled water so actually i don't know how good that water is but um <laughs> You know, we need more faucets and sinks where people can do that. That's one way. And then, you know, another thing we can do is like, um, you know, the tide tubes at the aquatic park need to get fixed. And, and that needs to be a high priority and put that money in there, even though it's gonna be super expensive. Um, and just, 
you know, I was just at Strawberry Creek today. It's such a sanctuary just to stand there at the, at the Strawberry Creek Park. Um, and that water looked clean, but we need to make sure that water is clean, you know, so to make sure that, you know, all the, our, the corporations we have in Berkeley are really doing the right thing because we don't know how that incident happened or a series of incidents at Aquatic Park and how that pollution got in there and those numbers got elevated. And I suspect, I mean, people blame the RVs, but, you know, I don't think that was the case. And I think it's probably coming from somewhere where people don't want to say that it's coming from. So um, we need to investigate what really caused that and correct that problem. And just yeah. put like sinks and, and, and more water fountains everywhere because our on house community are water insecure, you know, and they need it. Exactly. And I was thinking, I mean, the irony of Berkeley in our modern period is so not lost on me. We have a university of California that is creating CRISPR technology, that is doing revolutionary science in the fields of agriculture and data, but where are the resources given back to the Berkeley city? And how can we, in your opinion, persuade more and more research institutions to tangibly affect the life of the city because their students live here at the very least. At the very most, Berkeley has given a platform for many of these institutions to grow and build. So how can we start bringing resources back into the Berkeley community? Especially since gentrification, gentrification is driving humans and their skill sets out. You know, I think the one way that we could utilize the university more uh, or even other universities, because Berkeley has several, you know, even theology and all these other different mm -hmm. institutions. Um, but we're not using them to the full effect that we can, right? We could do like all these conceptual designs that we source out could be student led, you know, like for FREE, -E. it could be their semester project, you know, and we could save that money and put that money in towards like mental health services or outreach workers or, you know, water and sinks and more toilets and showers for our community. You know, um, I think that's one way, just one. Um, and I'm sure there's numerous others, but that's some, I mean, I've actually done that because when I got into office and thought about having the tiny home community at the corp yard, you know, the lawn bowlers and stuff, um, University of San Francisco made conceptual designs. They are absolutely gorgeous. I mean, the, the, the professor's an architect. The students are all architect students, or they might be environmental design. I mean, whatever you can, there's students out there that are looking and professors that are willing to accommodate the request, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, it still would take the same amount of time. So it would just be such a cost savings. Can you imagine? That would be amazing. And then the We've students definitely been say, trying. Yeah. you know, I mean, like right now, um, back when I first started, these students came to me from UC Berkeley that came up with the outdoor classroom and they wanted it at George Florence Park. How is that needed now in COVID times, right? Exactly. Outdoor classrooms at the park. And it was just, and they had, it was great because it, it was self-contained. It had like a stage, all the seating like tucked in underneath. You didn't, wouldn't even notice. It just looked like a stage from the front. So, I mean, if we had something like that, you know, with a surface that could be easily hosed down and clean, that's exactly what we need right now. Yeah. You know? And I can say for my standpoint as a student at UC, um, who just got back in during COVID, of course, <laughs> um, being at People's Park is a direct challenge to the UC for trying to bring those resources into the community. Because every time we build, every time we have classes there, um, really what I'm saying is, why don't you make all of UC like People's Park? Uh, use uh, the, uh, what is it, the, the uh, Clark Kerr campus, like all those acres there, why can't you have multiple classes in that campus area? Or why can't you use Memorial Glade that's on the campus there? And um, 
within talking about environmental justice, it's, it's kind of sad that, and yes, it's this institution, but it's problematic for many institutions. They're still trying to build on people's park, which people use, but they leave the chancellor's mansion intact and it's roughly the same size. And so the general question is how can we start pressuring these not governmental, but are quasi governmental agencies to really focus on protecting green spaces in their development plans, whether that is simply trying to make sure that we have public art available that people can walk through and see for free, or if it's developers having a percentage of um, some of their properties having to be generated for parks or environmental designs. Like, what do you think are ways we can start pressuring these non uh, Berkeley ent entities into making sure we have green spaces in our community? Good question. Well, we need to like make sure that we keep people's park for one. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I think, I, I guess part of anybody's development plan would have to be include some kind of green space, you know, um, either community green space or open, it would be nice if they were more open to the public though. Um, because, you know, what was it? I think it was that 18 story building downtown where they didn't want to, um, but give any access to the public. And that's like, that, that, that's wrong, you know? Like, and you know, there's, I've seen beautiful architecture with green um, on the outside of the building. We need to like get creative and, 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 and just like have more plants and as part of the architecture of the building. You know, kind of like, um, I don't know if you've seen what I mean, but I'm sure you have. So, because we don't have any more land in Berkeley, right? But we just mean, need to make sure that we maintain the space that we do have. And, uh, They could yeah. put hanging gardens at the top of buildings or the side of buildings, and that can now- Yeah, that's shade, what I mean, also, yeah. That would and be even nice. The freeways too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, then, there's there's so many creative things that we can do. You know, we just haven't done them yet. You know, and, and we need an opportunity to to change. This is the time. Exactly, it's time to have 2020 vision. <laughs> That's right. Um, Last question uh, from Sarah. San Francisco gave tax breaks to corporations with the stipulation that they give community hours to mentor youth or teach them a trade. What are your thoughts on this? Wow, that's a, well, I don't know about tax breaks. Will they get their tax breaks anyway? But I think that's a good idea. Um, we got to make them do something, you know, and that's, you know, they don't always give back and that's one way they can give back, you know, but they should be paid mentoring positions. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to pay them, not just like interns without any kind of monetary um, benefit. Um, but I think that's, and it has to be substantial, you know, just not, um, one or two. It has to be an ongoing situation. I mean, because that's exactly how I learned. It's like when I, I couldn't, go, when I graduated in 74 from high school, 76 from community college. And I said, I'll go back to school when it was free. Well, that didn't happen until like a long time later. I graduated in 13 and it took me 10 years, you know, so. Um, yeah, we could, I could give like, a short answer too. Yeah, I mean, I so I tempt, and that's how I learned by learn going to different corporations. That's how I got all my accounting skills, you know, because I was smart enough to figure it out. Even though you're a temp, people don't tell you everything. So I would have to figure out, oh, how to do this job with the work with the key information they omitted. I had to figure out what that key information was, and so I'm still that type of I'm. I am that type of person. You don't have to tell me 
you want me to give me a box so I can figure it out, you know? <laughs> so, um, but that's what we need to do, you know, because if, if everyone get, took advantage of what, what corporations could give them, you know, as far as uh, training and understanding, wow, that would be amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. But they have and to do it with a real, like, unbiased and not hold back kind of way, you know? Yeah, I definitely agree that the idea is interesting, but I would like to see it in a central agency. So the city of Berkeley, a workforce development program. Yeah, for sure. Like we don't need a corporation to do that. <laughs> Give them a tax break. Make the city do it. That's even better. Yeah. I would even suggest if corporations want to buy in, give the interns their benefits. So yeah. their mental health benefits, their sick leave, <laughs> all those things corporations can give to those st students and people um, without necessarily giving them power because we have to protect workers especially and hold them to union rights and making sure that they have a vocational trade that works for their future. Um, so we're almost out of time, Cheryl. Do you want to give some last thoughts or some words of wisdom and advice to our community members watching? Yeah, so we're in COVID-19 pandemic times. We have to remember to smile. We have to remember to laugh and just honor ourselves, love ourselves. We're in challenging times and the challenge, you know, we don't know. I mean, the news is so bad. Everything is just kind of depressing, but we have to remember to smile, even though all that's going on and to, to reach out to our loved ones and even people that were not loved so much because they might need a helping hand right now too. And we have to just honor them as well as honoring ourselves and be in solidarity because every, one person's issue is our, your issue too. And we um, just can't go back to corporate greed, corporate bullshit, you know, we have to take this moment in time and really, really act on it. You know, do all the things that the people out on the street are asking us to do. Show some courage, you know, really stand up, rise up, speak up. Power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, my last words for everyone is to really say thank you for taking the time to listen to our voices. Uh, where two people historically are kept out of the decision-making process. And so we're fighting for political courage, with political courage, to make tangible changes for the community because we're part of the community. I definitely want to say, uh, please support our campaigns. We're both up for election November 3rd, 2020. Mail-in ballots come the second week of October and really understand that we're both trying to fight for Berkeleyans to have a right to a clean environment, having a right to organize, and making sure that everyone comes to the table in the democratic process. And so with that said, Cheryl, do you wanna give some information how people can contact you or donate yeah. if they want? Sure, www.cherylDavila.vote. Um, and my city email, which you can't talk anything about electoral politics, but it's C Davila, D is in David, A V is in Victor, I L A at cityofberkeley.info. My work phone number, if you need me, 510-981-7120. And I wanted to thank you so much, Aiden. Um, you've been such a great friend and I really wish you well in this race. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard enough being, um, an elected official, but to have allies um, is really important. And I feel like you're right there with me, my brother. So thank you. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. And this has been great. I was a little nervous, but it, it turned out great, you know, so um, thank you. Absolutely. And thank you, Cheryl. If anyone wants to contact me, reach out to our secretary uh, at hello at hill.vote. And then uh, you can join the website at http uh, colon uh, slash slash hill, H-I-L-L dot vote. And so I want to conclude this program. This is a discussion about Black leadership in the age of COVID-19 and political courage from two people uh, running for office, with one being elected, Cheryl Dalla. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.
Thank you. Bye.